trying to teach angiograms to first year medical students, which is not an easy thing to teach. You don't need to know a huge amount. And to be honest, there's, not, there's only a couple of branches to each coronary artery, right? I think I'm learning. I need to just slow down, give time for the brain to think about what it's looking at. Using the 3D TV to try to get the idea of the shapes of the arteries, because stereoscopy works quite well like that, and get those shapes in your brain, then apply them to the, essentially the 2D radiograph, right? I mean, it's just plain difficult, right? To teach and learn. Anatomy is very much about shapes and 3D, isn't it? Okay, 10 or 11 hours of printing, did it work? Huh. Looks like it's all there. Last week we were looking at uh, the Terango Palatine fossil, which is really awkward because it is really difficult to work out what you're looking at in that region. Um, so I thought maybe I could try printing out a sphenoid bone, that very central bone in the skull, in resin. And maybe that would help us understand the anatomy there. Um, I can't see how much detail we've got here. I'll have to clean this up and we'll find out. Oh no, I've just realised that scaffolding's supposed to be going somewhere. We should have another pterygoid plate. There's one pterygoid process there. We should have another process there. And it's not there, so something's gone wrong. Oh well, I'll have to have another go. See, look, you can see the the support framework inside, which is very pretty, but I thought this might be the case. I thought it might be better to print this in grey resin. So I'll have another look at how I'm mounting this and try again in grey resin. Maybe we'll have a look at that in a future week. Looks a bit, looks sphenoidy, right though? Sphenoid bony. There's the problem. So this is the FEP film, so the light shines through the bottom of this, cures the resin layer by layer and it builds the model. And this has got a little bit of a, it's like a, it's like a drum, it's got a little bit of a, bit of a stretch to it. So that the print releases, goes ba-doing, ba-doing, ba-doing. But it's got a scuff, it's got a scratch, it's got a little hole and it leaked les resin through onto the screen. So i have to buy some more of those before I can do any more resin printing. That'll take a week. This 
this is it's in there is a Raspberry Pi. I don't know if you know about Raspberry Pis, but they are it's a little tiny computer. Uh, you can use them for all sorts of things. They're great. They run Linux. They're cheap. Um, and this one <laughs> is plugged into a display, which is running a kiosk mode of Chrome. And its only job is to tell me the number of the week, uh, the week of the year. Uh, and this isn't like your year. This is the number of the week of the academic year. So I, I run much of the anatomy teaching here, so I organise it. So I'm constantly working weeks ahead, um, sometimes a year ahead. And during the week, I'm always putting things up for the students. You know, the week before, I'm putting up the learning outcomes and some of the teaching for next year. I'm linking to videos. And then in the week, I'm putting up quizzes for the week. I'm making sure the, the presentations have gone up if they're available. Keeping track of what week I'm in is really, really helpful. So the only job this has it might seem small and a bit too small a job for something like this, but it's really useful for me. Now, this here that you saw me putting together, this does the same, <laughs> the same job. That is a Raspberry Pi, but it's a Pico or a Pico, I don't know. That computer back there, it's a microprocessor, costs four pounds. And you saw me soldering on the mail headers, which, I don't know, cost like 50p or whatever. This display is a little bit of a splash out. It's 20 pounds, um, but it's got over 100 LEDs on it. And for one, I can stop using my big thing and start using the, you know, it's a little bit different, it's a little bit of fun, um, but I can use my other Pi, that'll get reused on a, a 3D printer. It'll have OctoPrint and maybe a little webcam, time-lapse camera or something on there. Uh, and then this is just, it's, it's new, it's fun, it's funky, right? Um, but the main purpose for this is that the Raspberry Pico is something that I've always meant to play with, haven't played with, kind of needed a project, right? Um, you needed an excuse to have a play. This super bright, funky LED display I thought was nice. And with tools, you need to pick them up, you need to use them, you do need to play with them. Play is the right word. You need to find out what they can do so you can work out what you should do with them and even what you could do with them, things that may be unexpected. The more tools in your tool belt, the more ideas you come up with and you start making things that didn't exist before. This is something I will continue to tweak and play with. I mean, what I did was I used a, a bit of code that was on GitHub, thank you very much, um, because I didn't have time this week to actually um, program all the pixels to show the numbers, to show the date, so I used an existing scrolling app that I could feed information to. I then <coughs> added a bit of code on top, which uh, set the date, calculated the number of days this week, this year, did some math then to work out what week it was and so on. But I can continue to play and tweak with this. And by doing so, so the, the programming language I'm using is Python. I totally recommend if you want to learn to code, use the Pi or the Pico, use Python. It's pretty friendly. It's like having a really fun puzzle to try and solve. And the reason I like it so much is because you write code but you can get it to do physical things. It's like 3D printing. You can make virtual things and then you can make them real. Speaking of which, we should go and have a look and see uh, how those huge sphenoid bones have printed. 36 hour print, the, the final one. Oh yeah, look at that. It's a giant sphenoid bone. Let's pop that out and get some pipe cleaners. This one I've printed out fine. Uh, and this one I've kind of printed out on normal detail levels, but it looks, it looks great. Oh, look at the size of that. <laughs> it's huge. There we go. That's a little bit better might be a bit more recognisable. So what on earth have I been doing? Well, this is a sphenoid bone, right? Um, if we look at this on a skull, can you see where it is? So the sphenoid bone is this 
central spot here. But just like any of these like central bones of the skull, it's really difficult to work out where that bone is and all the features and which bit is part of that bone. My problem the other week was when we were in there and I was trying to describe the anatomy of the pterygopalatine fossa, which the sphenoid bone has a big role in. Now I've got maybe a couple of actual sphenoid bones, but they're really, really delicate. There aren't many of them because they tend to break down with handling. They're, they're really, really fine. All these, the pterygoid plates here and what have you break off and, and so on. So when I'm describing bits of the sphenoid bone, I thought if I could have not just a tough plastic one, but a really big plastic one, well, my fingers don't get in the way when I'm pointing at things. So this is a model from the Body Parts 3D database. It's a Japanese database with loads of anatomical bits in there. I'll put a link into it below. And uh, I think all the bits in there are covered by a Creative Commons license so I can adapt this and share it. And it had the... oval foramen, but it didn't have foramen spinosum. So um, I created that. I went to Tinkercad and I put that hole in there. You can actually see the like the depressions where it would have been, and it had foramen rotundum. Whenever we put a pipe cleaner through foramen rotundum, this is where the maxillary branch of the trigeminal nerve goes. We never see where it comes out on the skull, but here it's clear. That's where it comes out. Um, there's the superior orbital fissure, and that this is the orbit, this is the nose here. I know it's difficult in isolation, but if I was doing a proper video, I'd link it up with other stuff, right? So there's foramen rotundum. Down there is the pterygoid canal, or the vidian canal that the pterygoid nerve passes through. That didn't exist either, so I made that in software. So I took the model, stuck it in Tinkercad, made a couple of tunnels, mirrored and what have you, and then stuck it on my 3D printer slicing software and just made it as big as I could. And I think it's 200% size. Let's see if we can get a pipe cleaner down that pterygoid canal, shall we? And. Uh, See where it comes out. It was a pain to clean out that canal. Oh, look, there it is. So this was part of the pterygopalatine fossa that we were in. I'll try to remember to put this file up on uh, Thingiverse and I'll check the Creative Commons licenses and stuff and it still needs a bit of cleaning off. But oh my word, it turns out I love printing huge versions of bones. <laughs> I wonder what else I could print. Maybe I should have a crack at the ethmoid bone. That is so cool. And it's really helped my understanding because I had to look at this model, look at the real sphenoid bone. And if you look at real skulls, they're all a little bit different and work out exactly where I was placing that canal. I have, I have a much better understanding now because I spent time making something.